Worship and the completion of the work of God go hand in hand. When God does something great in our life, we are to worship. When God completes something, we are to worship. All through the process, we are to worship because we were created to worship. Hey there, family, and welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for joining me for another Bible study as we are walking through the book of Nehemiah. Before we get started into the teaching and you reading it, I want to remind you to go ahead and subscribe to this channel. As we are entering the end of this Bible study, I don't want you to think that it is over from here. This is really like just the beginning. We're just getting started with doing these studies, and I don't want you to miss what's coming up next. God has already been highlighting some things to me that I know he wants us to dive into. So I don't want you to miss it. Go ahead, subscribe to the channel and turn on those notifications in order for you to know when the next new thing comes out. The next thing that I want to mention, you probably have already heard, but just in case you haven't grabbed it already, go ahead and grab that companion study guide that goes with the Nehemiah study. It's really just going to enhance your time with God. You don't have to get it. It's not a necessity but it is something I'm encouraging you to get because the questions that are in there are going to help you to dive deeper as you are walking through the book of Nehemiah. So grab that companion study guide, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. And now you know what we do from here. You're going to read it. I'm going to teach. You're going to reread it. And then we're going to talk about it in the comments. So it is your turn. Go ahead and read Nehemiah chapter 12. Right, y'all it's nehemiah chapter 12 and we are here again presented with a list of names and people places and the necessary things that take part in this rebuilding process and nehemiah chapter 12 in and of itself is just one of those books that it may take a little bit more to digest it took me a couple days to even be able to know what to share from this book but when i sat down and spent some time with god i had some worship playing and i said Lord, what is it that you want me to share with your people from this? I heard the word holy history, holy history. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of what God showed me as I was unpacking Nehemiah chapter 12. As I was studying this, I felt led to pay attention to the significance of holy history. Holy history is a lifeline of the holy people. He creates a bridge from what was to what is to what is to come. So they go from what was, which was the exile, the lifestyle that they were living, the sins that they were walking in to now being holy and consecrated to the Lord. So what was, what is, and what is to come is when we see Jesus coming on the scene later in the New Testament. The list of names we see in verses two through 26 are a list of names that represent a holy history. Right now, you are part of a holy history. You're continuing it or you're the one starting it. I just want you to think of your own family. I want you to begin to consider what does it mean to have a holy history? What does it mean to continue on a history within my family of holiness, of people who are consecrated, people who are committed to serving the Lord? Are you the one starting it? Are you continuing it? But I want you to look in this book as we are reading through the book of Nehemiah and recognize how much a holy history was a part of what he is revealing to us through this book. It's not just a list of names, y'all. It is a list of, of names of people who God said these people are a representation of holiness. 
They're a representation of what I want my people to model. They were priests, they were Levites, they were musicians, they were singers, they were family leaders. And the family leaders had to model and had to represent a holiness that would now become the essence of what Jerusalem would be. It was not just a place. It was a place for people who wanted to carry the presence of God with them everywhere they went, because that's what holy means. It means to be consecrated and to carry the presence of God. So even in our lives, as we continue on a holy history, as we begin a holy history, we are beginning a history that is consecrated and that carries the presence of God. That is major. That is huge to know that I am carrying something that my children and my grandchildren, my nieces and my nephews, they will be able to look and see this is what a holy history looks like. That's what we are seeing in chapter 12. We're not just seeing names. We're seeing a holy history. The enemy wants us to abandon it, but God wants us to prevail. The enemy wants us to abandon the holy history that we are continuing or that we are starting. But God has a greater plan. He wants us to prevail in it. God had a greater plan for the Israelites. He wanted them to prevail in the holy history that they were establishing. Now, let's take a look at verses 27 to 31. For the dedication of the new wall of Jerusalem, the Levites throughout the land were asked to come to Jerusalem to assist in the ceremonies. They were to take part in the joyous occasion with their songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. The singers were brought together from the region around Jerusalem and from the villages of the Nephtaphales. They also came from Beth Gilgal and the rural areas of Jeba and Asmapheth, for the singers had built their own settlements around Jerusalem. The priests and the Levites first purified themselves, then they purified the people, the gates and the wall. I led the leaders of Judah to the top of the wall and organized two large choirs to give thanks. One of the choirs proceeded southward along the top of the wall to the dung gate. This is an important moment amongst the Israelite people, but I want you to pay special attention to verse 30. In verse 30, it tells us that the priests and Levites had to purify themselves first. Before they could extend the purification to the people, they first had to be partakers of it. They first had to purify themselves. And this made me think of Jesus, who is the high priest. You know, in the New Testament, when uh, John the Baptist baptized him, we have to wonder, like, he was completely clean. He was completely pure. Why did he need to get baptized? But it, to me, is symbolic of what we see right here, which is that he did that in order for us to know that we too ought to be doing it. He purified himself first. He cleansed himself first because he would then go forth and he would tell the women who um, was caught in adultery, go and sin no more. Look, I'm able to purify and cleanse you because I first did that. Now, even though he didn't need to be purified or cleansed, he did it as a representation of what it looks like for us. We too have to first be partakers of the instructions that we are giving to other people. I can't tell you how many times God had to convict me about this very thing, okay? Where if I'm teaching something, I first have to be a partaker of it. If I'm saying, hey, reading our word is so important, I first have to be a partaker of reading the word. I'll never forget when someone told me this and it kind of parallels with this itself. Um, I wanted to be a writer and many of you know that I have written a book called Taking the Five Beliefs. It is an amazing resource for people, um, no matter what season of life you're in, because I feel like we are called to live a leaping lifestyle, but it really helps us to understand understand the five biblical leaps. And I'll never forget when I was first starting my writing journey and I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't read other books. And someone said, you know, in order for you to be a good writer, you have to read books. And that seems like it is just this profound idea, but it is a truth that I've carried with me as I continue my writing journey. And it's the same thing with this. We first have to be partakers of the instructions that God gives us before we can release it to other people. These priests and these Levites had to first be partakers of the purification before they could go and try to help purify the Jews so that they were able to go before God as well. So now I want you to pay attention to how important music was to this moment. 
uh, as a musician myself, and when I say musician, I sing and I sing for the church. I don't have an album or anything, but I understand the importance of music and worship to creating an atmosphere that is inviting to the presence of God, but also how important it is to being thankful and to showing God that I appreciate what he has done in my life. So in this, we are watching as they are celebrating what God has done the goodness of the Lord. And there's an entire process to this whole thing. There, there are choir singing. I mean, huge choir singing. There's music being played. And this is all so that the goodness of the Lord can be shared. They are excited. They are celebrating what God has done. And then in verse 43, it says that many sacrifices were offered on this joyous day for God had given the people cause for great joy. The women and children also participated in the celebration and the joy of the people of Jerusalem could be heard far away. Y'all, this was not this little secretive moment where everyone was like, thank you, Lord. He's so good. Thank you for what he's done. The people far away, I mean, all over could hear them celebrating the fact that God had completed that which he said he would do. They were not being quiet with their excitement. When God does something good in our lives, we don't want to keep silent. We want to share the testimony of what he's done. We want people far and wide to hear how he has been faithful to fulfill that which he has said. It is an opportunity for God's glory to be revealed through us. So we see that the dedication had three parts, purification, thanksgiving, and sacrifices. Don't forget that in that last sentence, the people took sacrifices as part of their celebration. But the chapter ends by expressing the necessity and expectation for ongoing temple worship. Now, as a singer, I love this because even when I was younger, you could catch me walking around the house, singing my songs, worshiping God, singing as loud as I could until my sister would say, Rachel, why are you, why are you singing so much? <laughs> And I watched that even with my kids where my daughter will just walk around the house singing and my other daughter is like, oh my goodness, stop singing all the time. I believe that that's what was going on here is that there was just this continuous celebratory worship and Thanksgiving and singing that was happening because they were so excited about what God did. So as we get to the end of the chapter, we see that there is an ongoing worship that Nehemiah is inviting them into. Let's read verse 45 and 46. They performed the service of their God and the service of purification as commanded by David and his son Solomon. And so did the singers and the gatekeepers. The custom of having choir directors to lead the choir in hymns of praise and thanksgiving to God began long ago in the days of David and Asaph. Here what we see is that Nehemiah was establishing a standard of worship for the holy people. Holy people worship. They express their thanksgiving through worship. They dedicate themselves and worship the God who helps them complete the work he calls them to do. Worship and the completion of the work of God go hand in hand. When God does something great in our life, we are to worship. When God completes something, we are to worship. All through the process, we are to worship because we were created to worship. Worship with song is a declaration to others that God has done what he said. Verse 42 said, they played and sang loudly. And verse 43 says that they could be heard far and wide. Let me ask you this question. What completed work has God done in your life? Have you taken the time to dedicate yourself through worship? To dedicate what he has done? Because we can so easily move on to the next thing. And we're like, okay, God, I need this and I need this. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. We need to pause and we need to worship. We need to thank God. Their worship was their expression of thankfulness to God. Our worship is our expression of thankfulness to God. So I wanna encourage you today to think on the last thing that God has done in your life, the last prayer answer, the last miracle that you saw, the last thing that he said he would do and he did it, no matter how big or small it is, and begin to worship. Worship through song, worship through your words, Worship as you cry out to God. Worship and show him that you are thankful for what he has done. All right, y'all. That is the end of Nehemiah chapter 12. Now it is your turn. You go ahead and you reread Nehemiah chapter 12. And then, as always, let's talk about it in the comments. See you in Nehemiah chapter 13.